Hello again. Can you hear me? Hello again. Hello. So I'll leave the floor for part two for you. Thank you for joining us. And um, if you need anything, let we'll leave the last five minutes as agreed for a question, right? Definitely, definitely. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for returning. If this is, uh, if you were at the, the first lecture, the emphasis of this talk now would, will be on the clinical applications or the usefulness of vestibular bone potentials that you may or hope you will find in your own laboratories. I will be describing cases that I've seen rather than listing a, a, a list of cases that you would see uh, mentioned in the literature. And, um, and I hope this will clarify how useful this examination is. So I would like to first to show you this slide with regards to recording from the, from the elderly. Uh, like I mentioned in the, the first slide, uh, many reports in the literature uh, ask those performing the test uh, not to attempt to record in the elderly because there are many reports of unobtainable responses, either bilaterally or only one side. As I, as I mentioned with regards to the trick of obtaining these potentials, the, the best way, if you can, in your laboratory to record from the elderly is to record EMG, rectified average EMG, so you can monitor the EMG and to obtain a ratio between the EMG and, this, and the, uh, the CVAP, so you can get a good, adequate uh, value that can be um, reported as a parameter with regards to amplitude, but minimum contraction. You do not need a minimum level of contraction as mentioned or as um, demanded by most dedicated systems. This patient here that you see in front of you, 86 years old with an amplitude. Here we have um, a sensitivity of 50 microvolts division. No lie, this patient gave me a CVAMP of 86 microvolts. I even have a case of 100 microvolts in a patient close to 75, 80 years old. And this has mentioned, been mentioned in the literature on many occasions, uh, especially by, um, uh, well, the, there are reports of uh, such publications that I can send to you where the trick is minimum contraction. Contraction, yes, you need contraction, but you do not need too much. Too much contraction is bad for the response. A minimum level of contraction, record the EMG, obtain a ratio, and this level you see, 86 microvolts, is with minimum contraction. You can see here for yourself that you do not need strong contraction to get such a huge amplitude response and an amplitude that stands out from the background. So contraction, yes but contraction full stop. So it is possible to record from the elderly. Do not let the age prevent you from recording VAMPs in your patients. So this is uh, uh, my, uh, the second case, if you like, or the first detailed case that I would like to present to you. Um, I call this a neurological application of the VAMP. The reason I call this a neurological applica application is because this patient was sent from my neurology colleagues because she has epilepsy. But for two weeks prior to seeing me, she developed vertigo and imbalance. She was negative for positional nystagmus. She was taking vipraic acid for her epilepsy, stemidil and beta circ to control the symptoms. The question here that was presented to me when the patient came to me uh, on the referral letter 
was to rule out vestibular migraine. But on direct questioning of the patient, I already knew before performing the study that the patient did not have vestibular migraine. If you agree with me, you cannot have vestibular migraine without migraine. And this patient did not mention any significant episodes of migraine episodes. And in fact, what prompted the referring physician to, to ask whether this is indeed vestibular migraine is that the pure tone audiometry was within normal limits bilaterally. There was no indication of low frequency hearing loss. Now I, I show this slide for the benefit of those attending this lecture who are not in the ENT field. Um, in such cases, we tend to play between two differential di uh, between two diagnoses. The first is Menier's disease. Uh, we are talking of spontaneous episodic episodes of vertigo that last for a few days, go away, and may come back after a few months or the following year. And these episodes consist of episodes of spontaneous night by vertigo, no positional, no, pos no head position changes, and no fluctuations in the sound in the environment, spontaneous vertigo associated with nothing in the environment, fluctuating sense in your hearing loss, there is a feeling of loss of hearing, tinnitus, and the feeling of fullness in the ear. This has been associated histopathologically with a buildup of endolymph in the cochlear duct and the vestibular organs. Although it is known in the ENT uh, field that endolymph does not equate with Menier's disease, there are cases of proven Menier's disease without endolymph buildup or endolymph hydrops, as it's called, and also cases on histopathology of an accumulation of endolymph in the inner ear, but the patient did not have Menier's disease. We also have vestibular migraine, similar to, um, similar to vestibular um, to Menier's disease in that these episodes are spontaneous. We have spontaneous episodes of vertigo, but these episodes usually coexist or associated with separate episodes of migraine. And the uh, guidelines from the Barani Society agree with this, that you do need to have migraine episodes to have a, a diagnosis of vestibular migraine either together with the vertigo episodes or separately from the vertigo episodes. But the important thing here is that the main complaint of the patient is the vertigo and not the migraine. The cause of this is unknown um, with regards to vestibular migraine. There have been reports of both central and peripheral causes. There was one report I remember many years ago of talking about endolymphatic hydrops. This was not repeated. And in this case, this appeared in both ears. But again, this was just one study. Now, how do you decide between Menier's disease and vestibular migraine? Even though I mentioned that vestibular migraine can show migraine episodes either to, together with the vertigo or separately as a separate migraine episode, there are cases of Menier's disease that can show migraine as well. Also, even though Menier's disease is characterized by tinnitus, you can have tinnitus and vestibular migraine. And if, the, if this isn't bad enough, there are some patients that can have both Menier's disease and vestibular migraine. And because the emphasis in management is different for either Menier's disease and vestibular migraine, it's good from the very beginning to differentiate between these two cases and to determine which of these two uh, diagnoses the patient has or if indeed they have both at the same time. The trick here with regards to CVAMP, uh, to performing a CVAMP, especially when you have a suspicion of Menier's disease and or vestibular migraine, is to perform the CVAMP at two frequencies. I mentioned in the first uh, lecture that the optimum or the best tone frequency to use to obtain a good CVAMP response or even an OVAMP response is 500 Hertz. This is where you will get the best response in physiologically normal individuals in at least 95, 98% of cases. But when there is the question of endolymphatic high drops, like I said, endolymphatic high drops is a histopathological term, but I use this to describe the possible pathology with regards to, for example, Menis disease, is that 
you need to stimulate also at one kilohertz. The reason we need to have, you need to study to, to perform CVEMS at both 500 hertz and separately at one kilohertz is to determine if the phenomenon of frequency tuning is present for your patient. And what do we mean by frequency tuning? That instead of having a better response at 500 hertz, you instead have it at one kilohertz. And as has been reported uh, several years ago in 2011, and I will show you some cases now, that in cases of Menya's disease, or at least, and I will describe what I mean by this, endolymphatic high drops, if you like, involving at least the sacral or the otolith organs, there will be a shift of maximum amplitude from 500 hertz to one kilohertz. If it's vestibular migraine, it will remain at 500 hertz, the maximum response. But with Menya's disease, this will usually shift to one kilohertz. So I'll show an example here. This is what I showed you in the first lecture with regards to the importance of recording EMG. Even though there isn't, this is 500 hertz. This is a uh, response of 10 at 500 hertz, left ear and right ear. Their symmetry is not real. As I said in the first lecture, the amplitude is larger on the left because the EMG is larger on the left. Hence the importance of recording EMG, or if you're not able to record EMG, to control the contraction of the muscle to defined limits. So this is the same patient, 500 hertz. I'm showing the right here only. Take my word for it. The EMG contraction is similar for both the left ear and the right ear, but 500 hertz produces this response. At one kilohertz, a larger response. Normally, you will get a better response at 500 hertz, but in this case, the response is larger at one kilohertz. And this is what we mean, and this is what the literature refers to as frequency tuning, a shift of the maximum response from 500 hertz to one kilohertz. What I would like to mention here, and this is something that is often missed in the literature, I see, case, I see mention of patient groups where patients are not included in the study if the responses at 500 hertz are absent. I don't know if there is no details of this in the, the, these same papers, but it is possible and you need to keep in mind that because of this phenomenon of frequency tuning, it is possible, and I believe I have one or two cases in my library of data where you can have an unobtainable response at 500 hertz and the CVEMP response at one kilohertz. This would again represent frequency tuning, a better response at one kilohertz. It's just that at 500 hertz, there is no response and the response at one kilohertz. Again, translating to a better response and frequency tuning. So um, if I may, um, express my personal uh, opinion that um, for those who do plan to publish these papers and if you do see these papers in the future to have a skeptical a thought in your mind that the fact that a response is unobtainable at 500 hertz does not mean you will not get a CVAMP full stop going to 100 kilohertz what to go to one kilohertz may allow you to get a response and confirm the presence of something that would be to, to confirm to the diagnosis of Menya's disease. So, but the, the patient's audiogram, as you noted earlier, is normal. And as you know, the gold standard for pure tone audiometry and in patients with Menya's disease is to see a loss in um, low, low frequencies, hearing in the, the low frequency range. So, um, how is it possible that we have this frequency tuning and yet the audiogram is normal and why do I argue the fact that this may be still Menya's disease? Well, this may not be as we describe Menya's disease. This is what we, what is described frequently in the literature, if you agree with me, as a typical Menya's disease, if this is what they refer to, that a patient has symptoms that sound like 
Menier's disease, um, but the pure tunnel geometry is normal. And uh, this refers to confusion. This leads to confusion to the, the, the referring uh, physician. But there is a report in the literature, especially by Tohiji Murafushi in Japan, that you can have what can be described as endolymphatic high drops, or at least pathophysiological involvement of the vestibular labyrinth and not involving the cochlea. So if we have a phenomenon, if you believe the, the existence of endolymphatic high drops with regards to the, uh, the cause of these symptoms, that you may have this phenomenon existing in the inner ear, not involving the cochlea, hence the normal pure tone audiometry, but involving the vestibular labyrinth. And if the calorics were also, would, if the calorics were also found to be, would also be found to be abnormal, we would be talking about the vestibular labyrinth being involved in the cochlear knot. And this is what's been described at the moment as recurrent peripheral vestibulopathy. So, as if we don't, uh, so we basically, we, we don't have two conditions to differentiate between. We also 